and go. Okay. Um, hi, everybody, and welcome again to the Popular Music Books and Process series, uh, PIMBIP, a joint project of IASPIB US, the Journal of Popular Music Studies, and the POP Conference, which is now sponsored by the NYU Clive Davis Institute. I'm Carl Wilson, one of the series organizers, along with Eric Weisbart and Kim Mack. Uh, you can find our whole calendar on the IASPIM website. And you can catch up on videos of past sessions, including last week's on region, radio, and reality and hip hop on Eric Weisbart's channel on YouTube, which we encourage you to do and share widely. Um, next week, March 23rd, we have a special session on new and upcoming biographies with Rob Kenner on Nipsey Hussle, Yuval Taylor on Fleetwood Mac, and Aidan Levy on Sonny Rollins. But today, we're honored to have Anthony Reed with Vijay Iyer discussing Anthony's new book, Soundworks, Race, Sound, and Poetry in Production, which came out in January from Duke University Press. Uh, quick bios. Anthony Reed is an associate professor of English at Vanderbilt University. He's the author of Freedom Time, The Poetics and Politics of Black Experimental Writing, which won the 2014 William Sanders Scarborough Prize from the Modern Language Association. And his essays on black music and literature have appeared widely in journals and anthologies. And composer pianist Vijay Iyer has released two dozen albums, including the forthcoming trio disc Uneasy on ECM, and has collaborated with Amiri Baraka, Wada Wadada Leah Smith, Carrie Mae Weems, Teju Cole, Henry Threadgill, Mike Ladd, and many, many others. He has received a MacArthur Fellowship, among many other awards, and was the four-time Jazz Artist of, Ye of the Year in the Downbeat International Critics Poll. He is the Franklin D. and Florence Rosenblatt, Rosenblatt Professor of the Arts at Harvard, appointed jo jointly in music and African and African American studies, and his writings have also appeared in many journals. Um, so during their conversation, please put your questions in the chat sidebar. And at the end, Kim Mack, who's going to host the Q&A, will use those to call on you to unmute and ask them in the discussion. And of course, you can also use the chat for comments and for chat. And so all of that out of the way, Anthony and Vijay, please take it away. Thank you. And thank you to um, the organizers, especially to Eric and to Kim. Kim, who uh, I'll just speak for myself, did the, the work of corralling me to actually like respond to emails. Thank you and for all of your, your hard work. I'm very excited to be a part of this um, forum and to present my work. I thought that what I would do would be just to read one, a little, a very little bit of the book. Um, the primary object of the book, the, the thing that it studies is phonographic poetry, the recorded collaborations between poets and musicians. And one reason for that is I wanted to really think about, I wanted to pose myself the question, what does paying attention to collaboration do to sound study? And I quickly realized that I didn't know how to write a book that could talk about historical live performance, nor did with the particulars of um, professional responsibility. I didn't feel that I had the time to, to adequately learn how to do that. But there's also a fundamentally uh, intellectual and theoretical reason for my focus on sound recording, which is as, I, as much as I thought about um, collaboration following the work of people like Alexander Wellier, I found myself really wanting to think about medium and how medium might also shape what's possible to think and not. So I'll just, as I said, read a little bit of the book that covers that in particular, and then um, be ready to this yield to a more free-flowing conversation. This is from the introduction. Through mixed media, vernacular avant-garde textual practice, Black poets and musicians sought to reconceive community and the common that attends it. Keeping attention on the site-specific practices and texts through which people shape and contest meaning, I avoid references to Blackness in the abstract. While I've learned from Fred Moten's understanding of Blackness as, quoting him, an ongoing eruption that arranges every line, close quote, my question involves the ways Black texts produce, contest, and disseminate the meanings of Blackness, a social relation, 
which then obtains a phantom of activity as parallel ontological. That's the first is Lukács' term, the second is Nam Chandler, a para ontological presence. Text does not refer to recording or writing, but to something closer to medium and the surplus generated by what grammar and intertextuality produce in the interstitial play between different kinds of utterances. Attention to text allows simultaneous attention to the constitution of Black sound as a set of relations among economic, political, professional, and affective interests rather than a narrow understanding of the music industry. From this vantage point, I attend to the aesthetic possibilities afforded by new performance, recording, transmission, and playback techniques and technologies um, to, as, to take on dimension. Text thus refers to an open-ended material practice, excuse me, text thus refers to open-ended material practices and processes and objects, as well as the interaction among temporal, grammatical, material, and figural processes of signification that allow Blackness to appear as both an open set of incongruous and contested meanings and a transcendental signified or objective thing rather than the social relation it is. My framing allows a richer picture of the theoretical, physical, and political investments Black sound practice encodes. Moreover, this framing requires attention to the media concepts or historically contingent desires that make Black sound work. Um, black sound work, rather than assuming a stable audience as recipient, often does the work of calling to a prospective audience, a not yet audience of drawing together a we. Drawing on the work of Jacques Rancière, Sadia Hartman, Fred Moten, and others, I'm interested in the ways aesthetic projects align collectivity and ongoingness, and in the ways they participate modifying Rancière, not in the production, but in the improvisation of the common, the improvisation of communism. Rather than institutional forms such as the party, or debates such as reform versus revolution. Communism in this book refers primarily to conceptions of social organization that are not organized around property relations or capital. Improvisation of the common holds open space within which to conceive and take seriously alternative social structures where production is not necessarily the production of value. Black community never a defensive exclusivity or formation grounded in origin or originary rupture, my best name the socio-spatial forms produced by and that condition the production of marginal social life, where margin indicates the continued production of an outside to a putative mainstream. At its most radical, Black sound work is a practice of Black collective thinking and feeling that opens onto new configurations of the social. Analysis, excuse me, analysis of phonographic poetry through medium requires a different line of thinking about the way sound practice draws on the past, itself mediated by previous texts, not to simply affirm group belonging um, or historical formation, but to attempt to imagine and call into being new ways of being collective. And I'll stop there. And as I said, I didn't want to read too much, but I think that that gives you a sense of the, the, the shape of the book and the kind of different overlapping um, methods, but also the, the, the upshot, the positive argument and how I think of this as a, a book that's an intervention into Black sound studies. And I hope one also into Black studies and into um, popular music studies, in particular, emphasizing that we take for granted, there's a, a long, um, within jazz studies, there's a long debate about what's the role of records, but really wanting to foreground those, not as something either to um, 
treat as an invisible medium that we don't have to attend to, nor as something that's necessarily linked to industrial concerns and the um, exploitation of the musicians, but that holds, holds possibility for the people who make the music and for the ways that they imagine its circulation and the life and afterlives it can have. And I'll, I'll stop there. Um, <clears throat> great. Uh, hi, everybody. It, I'm really um, humbled to be here in the face of this uh, incredible work by Professor Reed, and also just in the face of all of you brilliant people who I'm, I'm looking at all of your portraits and um, yes, a little uh, daunted, shall I say, by the amount of brain power gathered here. So um, it's nice to meet you all in person. Uh, I was really um, touched and honored that Anthony uh, asked me to be a part of this and um, to support this incredible work. Um, I can say that it's been very generative for me. I've been spending the last few weeks with it. And there, I, I was just telling him that there's something for me that I want to chew on in literally, literally every paragraph of this book, which I, I don't think I can say that about really many books. So, um, so I just want to uh, shine a light on just the, the love and care that is in this book, the, um, the attention to a slice of the archive that uh, I feel is understudied, under, unsung, let's say, and, um, and really generative. There's, um, <clears throat> I, I wanted to maybe start by asking you, Anthony, about your choice of archive. Um, you said a bit about it, some very potent framing just now. Um, but uh, maybe how, maybe you could tell us a little bit about how this collection of texts, sonic texts that you're working with came to be, how they came to be the ones for you. These artists, I mean, Mangus and Langston Hughes, Amiri Baraka, Cecil Taylor, Archie Shep, Martina Roberts, um, Jane Cortez. Um, and why, why these artists and why these particular moments in their work? Um, thank you. And thank you for your, your generous comments. I'll say I initially planned to write a book that had um, a greater sweep. I wanted to cover, or I thought what I thought I was going to do, and actually Ken Whisker, who was here, he knows the full unwieldy ambitions that I will not confess to here, um, but some things stay between you and your editor. I, but I did think that I was going to, I mean, I had ambitions to write about your work with Mike Ladd. I had ambitions to write about some of Nicole Mitchell's work and um, some of Mike Reed's work and just things that are up to the present. And I really wanted to march right through and cover a whole range of um, creative music. And in part to really insist that one, that there is a tradition there and that it's wide and varied and that those of us who care about it and care about black music need to um, engage the variety of it. And so that's how the Mingus, um, the it's Baraka with the New York Art Quartet primarily um, Jean Lee was the one person I don't, I don't think you, you named. What happened is that, and I just want to name her. I'm not, it's course, not a, yeah, I did too. <laughs> um, what, what happened in the course of starting to write it was just realizing I kept wanting to have these historical asides, historical segues or interludes, trying to locate things. I found that there was so much qualm and qualification in every general statement that I wanted to make that. Um, and also I felt that there was such a, it seemed to me tendency to misread or to discredit some of what was going on in the, in the black power era, in the era of the emergence of free jazz that really I needed to sit with that, that if I wanted to give a genealogy of black sounds 
and of Black media, that the place to do that would be to really sit with that moment um, with Black arts defined not by, you know, nationalist rhetoric and um, fashion, but by the creation of and promotion of um, independent and radical aesthetics, but also totally separate and independent institutions that allowed people to make a claim for their own music and its own, on their own terms. And starting to try to tell that story meant that I needed to ground it historically and save my interest in what's happening now for another project, which, um, which I'm working on. These particular people I thought were, were exemplary of just a range of tendencies. And by no means did I want, I, I'm gonna just paraphrase Cedric Robinson. I, I don't claim to have exhausted the topic. I really just wanna say that it's there and that the sheer ubiquity of people in the 60s and early 70s and late 50s performing with poets and who are not thinking about the kind of beat model, the Dobie Gillis model, but who are really trying to do something substantive and creative together, who are really thinking about collaboration in rich ways. I just wanted to start to name that so that other people entering into those archives would also have a sense of how do you think about Amos Moore appearing, not just on any Muhal Richard Abrams record, but on his debut, right. those kinds of questions. Yes. Yeah, and it's, um, well, I'm, I'm honored that I might actually be in the sequel. I, I can't wait, uh, keep me posted on that. <laughs> but, um, <laughs> and I, I have to say, I wanna thank you. Um, about a year ago, not long after we all found ourselves in enclosed spaces indefinitely. Um, I did, uh, a student of mine um, was organizing these informal poetry readings. And I was really hoping to find this recording of me playing with Baraka, because um, we, we made an album. And I have a bunch of copies of it and none of them play. So I was like, heartbroken that I can't get any of this. I can't prove that it happened and, and I can't even just come back to it. But um, I was kind of, I put out some morose complaint on Twitter and here comes Anthony Reed with the, you know, he pulls it out of his vault and like, here, here, I've got the files right here. So I was um, just, uh, you know, just your attention to all these, um, cracks in the archive you know all these like moments these like tenuous moments that are barely there like um that other moment of baraka performing with the new york art quartet i realized i was at that concert and i didn't even know that they made a, an album of it um from 1999 because i remember it vividly and then i i tracked it down and realized yeah i was there i was there. so uh, so all these things that i didn't know even existed um and this fixed medium that you're calling phono poetry, phono poetry, is that photo poems, phonographic poetry? Phonographic poetry. <clears throat> um, but I like that compact phono, phono poem. I like that word too, that you use throughout. And in particular, like the, um, the provocation that these should be taken as texts, right? Not just texts because they contain literal text, but in the sense that they operate um, in dialogue, um, that they produce their own kind of field of signification that, I mean, there's a kind of Derridian move going on there and that provocation. And, I mean, you said a bit about it, but I wonder <clears throat> if you might, I feel like there's more to say in, in like what you're doing by insisting that these can be addressed textually and that they could be read. I mean, I remember once someone asked me if listening was reading. And so I wonder how you might answer that. Yeah, that's a great question. Um, it reminds there's, uh, and within media studies, there's an essay, and of course, now that I try to think of it, I can't call the author's name that asks, is sound recording like a language? 
And it, one of the points that the author makes is, uh, I almost got it, Alan, Alan Williams, I think is his name. Um, one of the points that he makes is that the sound recording is always in the residue of many different moments of reading. There's the, you know, a kind of music reading, but then and collaboration and play is one of those, a key concept for the book that wasn't in the section that I read. Um, but then there's the sound engineers kind of making choices in the moment of miking the music about what, um, and this is Deridian because it's the future interior, what will have been important to hear. And then the, the, every agent along the way who shapes the final product so that what we're really trying to be attuned to is the set of the many relations that go into shaping any particular document that we have. Listening is like reading to me in that you, the listener is, involves herself in what she's listening to, that there's not a neutral stance, it's not objective. Um, we can pretend that it is, but it's always in the way of all of those engineers and the people who record it and produce it. The listener too is, um, oh, thank you for uh, Jonathan Leal for putting that in the chat. Um, I'm going to close that because I, I, yeah, I will not be able to stop looking at it. Um, <laughs> but that there's the, that level of involvement, but not only involvement and of hearing it through one's own matrix of desires and past experiences, hearing it through the lens of what one hopes to share with somebody else later in that way that we say, oh man, you have to listen to this. And I've had the experience at least of doing that and then playing it in the presence of someone else and hearing something entirely different that what I thought was there wasn't there, but something else is. And so that sense of it being generative, productive, and not just reproductive, but also involving. Um, in that way, it is very much like reading, even as it accesses a different set of senses and a different, um, a different history and history of sense making. Um, yeah. So finally, I mean, finally, it's in that to distinguish sound from noise requires an aesthetic judgment in the same way that uh, distinguishing marks on a page from script requires an judgment and all of the history that that entails. Uh, listening very much is like reading. Yes. Um, but then uh, where is, um, where are bodies <laughs> in, in that process? Um, both not, just bodies that are being read, but bodies that are reading or bodies that are listening? Well, this is where listening is different from text reading, from print read or script reading is the sound is vibration. So to read, to read a screen like, you know, you know this, we all, the light sort of shoots into your eye. To read a page, the light reflects off of the page and into your eye and there's a kind of you have some distance from what you're reading, but sound is vibration, whether it's in um, headphones or in space. I remember having a debate with somebody who I think assumed because I, you know, I'm not a wealthy person that I had never had access to premium sound equipment over the difference between headphones and speakers. And I had had, I just had randomly had experience working in a recording studio as a student and said, look, I like monitors better. I like to feel the sound. It's just something that's different. And um, then headphones. So that, that that sense of the, the, that the music can actually move you, can physically touch you in a way that words on the page don't. And that that physical touch, uh, I think, can generate something else affectively that we often lack the language for is what distinguishes it from other forms of reading and makes poetry a natural pairing with music insofar as if we follow Audre Lorde, one of the things that poetry does is give words to those things we don't have names for, we don't have words for yet. 
Yes. You know, I was just telling, um, actually, I was just talking to Teju the other day, and, and he was asking if I prefer headphones over speakers. And they're such qualitatively different experiences, right? Um, in one case, sorry, you can hear Harlem. Uh, in one case, you can, you find yourself pinned to the center of the stereo image, right? And your, and your vantage, your aural vantage is fixed. If you move your head, you're still experiencing the same thing. Whereas with, when you when you have a sound in the room with you that you can walk around in and you can interact with physically that, you know, both it touches you, but also you can reach into it. You know, you can find, you can locate yourself in different parts of it in a way. And that's, um, I find that to be generative, but then uh, in this vein, I'm thinking, I just want to pull out a bunch of like provocative phrases. I mean, you're so good. For, it's like you stuff paragraphs with these phrases that I just want to like chew on for months. One of them is vibrational societies, vibrational societies. So like, that is a, <laughs> this is kind of where, where, you know, when we talk about bodies, we're actually talking about the social, right? So, um, or the, the, the common, let's say. So I wonder if you might elaborate or unpack that phrase that you use so potently. This, I mean, I, I should say this is, I am glad you drew that phrase out because it's an example of, um, a textual and intertextual collaboration. So I drew that phrase, Vibration Society, from Nathaniel Mackey writing about the lyric, but Mackey draws it from Rassan Roland Kurt. And um, I can't call which record it is, but of course it's records um, in the end. And that's one of the things that I, it draws me to records is that we should- It'll be them. in the chat momentarily, I'm sure. <laughs> <laughs> It's true. Um, I should stop saying I can't remember things, but I can. I, there's my memory's leaky. But that is exactly that. It is about the social. And while I don't want to make a, I don't, I don't want to make a fetish of live listening. There is something that's qualitatively different. So I mean, it's a question of scale. There's I'm listening in my headphones usually when I'm um, listening to try to hear things in detail. When I'm listening in a room, I'm usually well, over speakers, I'm usually listening with, um, with other people and I wanna share that music with them. And the thing about sound is, um, and I, actually you write about this too, I think, um, Vijay, it changes depending on the environment that it's in so that there are more people in the room and particulars about what they might be wearing and how the sound will vibrate off of them. You're also hearing the sound interacting with the people in the room that you're in. And something transformative can happen anyway. It doesn't always in live performance where you're having this experience and Mackie is so good at describing that with the whole room full of people. And it becomes really just about the experience of being linked with these people in a common experience in a moment in time. I think records give you the sort of uh, imaginative version of that, that maybe we've all, may we all have had the experience of listening to a record and saying, man, I hope someone else is as lucky as I am to have heard this. I can't believe it and I can't wait to go and share it. And to really have that experience, um, the experience that I imagined with someone else, knowing that it'll be a different one than the one I imagined. Yeah. And a different one from the one you just had, right? Yes, yeah, exactly. How the, how sociality augments the, and confounds and complicates and um, extends the listening experience. Uh, so, you know, you focus on these, these fauna poems or fauna, you know, I'm not, I'm not gonna get the phrase right every yeah. time, but uh, particularly it's the rub of the voice against instruments, against instruments being played, handled. So it's the, it's that juxtaposition of um, 
vocal gestures and let's say gestures of the hand or of the arm of the of the digits of you know maybe the embouchure you know mm. um and so there's that particular kind of tense tension i guess that comes of that juxta that particular juxtaposition both that there's language that's being um, uncorked right in the in the vocal production but also that it is it has this sort of like friction in the space of music i was thinking you know like when i was listening to that um langston hughes and, and mingus um it, it feels a little discrepant, shall we say, I guess is the word, you know, to use another Mackie-ism. And, um, and so I guess maybe this is a way into your, your framing of fugitive voice. Uh, I wonder if you could open that category up a little for us. Yes, thank you. What I was, so there's a, there is a long, history of that I'm trying to work with and to some extent against of the voice becomes a sign of the you know of interiority and thus of the person the speaking voice the intelligible voice becomes a kind of sign of being human in a certain way and I have in the, the section right after what I just read a sort of um, I try to get some distance on Ranciere on that point um, and the idea that in intelligible speech, that you move the line between intelligibility and unintelligibility and something, you know, happens. So that transforms the social that I don't think is quite true, nor did I want to, as I think, I think I use the term fugitive voice, especially to discuss Archie Shep. And there's the tendency that people have to really focus on a few handful of comments that he makes, many of them with the liberator or in conversation with Larry Neal um, and others. And they'll be, be dismissive of Shep, be dismissive of some of the claims that he made for what his music could do. And I wanted to really sit with that and say, well, Shep was, he was a smart man. And he understood what he was doing and what he was saying and the limits of it, but also that there's something in his performance that he could not have intended. And that there's, there's something in each of those recorded moments and in improvisation that opens onto what just simply could not have been intended, what couldn't have been known or foreseen. And one term for that is this fugitive, is that which strays even the apparent in, um, intention of, of the person I'm um, speaking, but also the musician. And without getting into, sound recording is great. And actually Mackie again is really great for noticing and making a big deal of flubs. There's a moment on, um, and I'm, I'm sorry, I'm gonna be a little arcane for a moment, on the Andrew Hill record on Point of Departure on the opening track, Joe, well, Joe Henderson, Henderson comes in. <laughs> I didn't know exactly what you mean. Blows by a chorus. He's like, rant, rant. Yes. Go, no, yes, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, I know it very well. I've heard steps, it hundreds of times. Steps right on Richard Davis's solo. Richard mm -hmm. Davis just keeps right on moving. And that's the kind of thing that at first, I'm sure, I'm sure the technology existed. And Joe Henderson, I have to wonder, did he hope that they would just go and scrub that? Because it's in stereo. You could just scrub his track. <laughs> and you would just hear it as an echo, but they kept it in. And that there's something about that, that he maybe he knew, maybe they all understood that, you know, this is going to resonate in a way. It's going to do something. We need to keep it. We have to be faithful to it. And that sense of, I mean, that's a sort of extreme example of the totally unintended that for me now has become one of the things I love about that record. I ironically anticipate the moment of Joe Henderson's, you know, anticipating his own solo. I think actually what he's doing is anticipating the, the backgrounds that they do. Because the next chorus around, they do this little figure, ensemble figure that sets up the solo. That's right. And that's... So that's what he's trying to do. And it, so it's almost more like everyone else left him hanging. They're like, oh, we're, we weren't ready. You know, it's that kind of thing. It's one of those moments. Uh, either way, it protrudes, right, in the sonic 
surface. It's sort of like, um, it's this weird, uh, this, this weird kind of um, misfit moment. Uh, but then also like, you know, we don't wanna, <clears throat> I always worry about this with just any kind of discourse around improvisation that moments like that are used as proof of its kind of fragility, vulnerability, imperfection. And if you follow this train of associations, it leads you down an abject path. It reminds me of the time where I was actually at a symposium where Archie Shep spoke and he started his talk by pulling out a thesaurus and reading the synonyms for jazz. Mm. And all of them were in the vein of garbage and nonsense, you know? And so this is why he refuses, refutes any, you know, he just refuses to use that term. And this is why many, you know, generations of people have pushed back against that term, which is why there's a term creative music and creative musicians as a sort of pushback from the last, over the last 60, 50 or 60 years now. Um, uh, and even the phrase, the new thing, and all these other kind of phrases that push back. Um, but you work with the, with improvisation and really, with the term improvisation and really, um, I don't even want to say rehabilitative, but actually more like, um, uh, ennobling. There's something ennobling about it uh, in the in the way that you kind of recover what that word can do. Um, both like improvisation and free. I mean, that's another term that you know many people kind of reject. I remember Wadada Wadada Leo Smith saying like, "Well, our music is based off of systems, and systems aren't free." You know, so so he's you know like that um, becomes a kind of I guess I can say that I never hear musicians use the phrase free jazz. But you talk about, I'm just going to read, I love just reading these sentences. I mean, I don't know if you are a poet, but you could be, I guess I'll put it that way, because there's like, um, there's a, let's say a musicality, maybe it comes from attending to poets, at least. Um, what if maintaining a place for the person or personality of its performers, we conceive free jazz as the pursuit of a freedom more fundamental and more difficult to name than those modes of freedom bound to the liberal form of the person and the subject? What if, in other words, we took seriously, it's taking seriously the possibilities of play and playing? So you, you, all, you use the word play here and playing um, in a way that's also maybe post Derridian, um, but then also um, there's something else going on here. So I would just wonder if you might, like maybe the, what the word free is doing in, in relation to any of this, maybe that's a, a start for starters. <laughs> um, what the word, well, I, I, in freedom time sort of have, I guess, the intuition that we need to um, hold on to the term free, that especially in the midst of this pandemic, freedom is def defined um, and in the kind of anti-cancel culture moment, freedom is defined by the ability to inflict harm on others without any consequence, um, without repercussions. And I think that that's, or is defined um, simply in terms of the freedom to dispose of your own property. And I think that there are other definitions that are worth holding on to and that are worth fighting for. And that when Ornette Coleman called his album Free Jazz and when people got excited about that, they heard something and that, and that that something is real. And I wanted to retain that even though the musicians themselves because for good reason um, have, have stepped away from it. And one of those reasons is, for example, um, Gins Allen Ginsberg referring to Jack Kerouac's prose as spontaneous bop prosody, which for me made me want to have nothing to do with spontaneity or bebop or prosody. 
because if that's your idea of what this has been doing, we really need to start talking about something else. There's somewhere, and George, George Lewis, I think it is, maybe it's Graham Locke, cites Anthony Braxton talking about creating a context in which we can be free. And that, that for me has been in my mind a way of trying to hold together what often registers as attention in um, jazz studies and especially in musicology between composition and improvisation. You know, the people like Cecil Taylor will be dismissed and called, he's not really a, he's not really a composer or they'll say Thelonious Monk, he's a tune writer, not a composer, which I think is obscene. Um, because what he's doing is creating and shaping a context within which to explore. He's creating a set of boundaries within which to explore, not by, your, by oneself, although um, there are beautiful solo renderings of Monk, um, but with other people. It's about creating the context within which people can really think, um, think, think together and play as a kind of commitment to open-ended exploration within contexts that maybe can undermine those contexts and create new ones is one of the things that uh, I continue to find in jazz and in, in creative music. I hold on to the term jazz because of its historical specificity, even knowing the, um, the problems. And I hold on to free because it really is about, it seems to me, creating alternative structures and alternative ways of thinking and thinking together. And I cite Sadia Hartman for that, just to think beyond the kind of burden individually, individuality towards um, a diff different horizons. Yes, and you, uh, I think you say that Baraka stays with the burden, right? Uh, yes, uh, well, it's those juxtapositions maybe that kind of, um, you know, the juxtapositions like that that activate this whole text, um, and because of that, the you know I find the word ambivalent being this kind of like running qualifier throughout. Mm. Um, but also that that ambivalence is productive. I think you also use the phrase "unfinished business" <laughs> in a very productive way. Um, but maybe I want to think about this other juxtaposition that you make, which is vernacular avant-garde, and so and. What are those two words doing with and against each other? Um, maybe you could open that up for us. Sure. So this is, um, there's, a, there's a scholarly conversation that I'll, I'll just sketch a little bit where um, I drew the term vernacular from Miriam Hansen, who is, was searching for an alternative to popular because of the ways in discussing early cinema, especially in Hollywood cinema, popular has this, this slipperiness where it will move between being simply descriptive, lots of people like it, to um, a, a kind of judgment. And it will do so often within the same sentence. Um, Jim Smethurst writing about, who's one of Baraka's really greatest critics, I think, he wanted to advance the idea of a popular avant-garde, specifically referring to the popular front. Um, I, my research didn't actually bear out the sense that uh, Mary Baraka, Archie Shepp, Cecil Taylor, and the other people I write about had anything substantial to do with the popular front. And except for Mary Baraka, it's hard to be sure who was actually involved formally with, with communist institutions. And so I thought that the, what they all have in common, whatever their actual um, political leanings is an investment in vernacular forms in saying that we're trying to reproduce the sounds of the church, of the neighborhood, of the brother on the street. And we wanna make records that will appeal and will do so by being versions of what's already familiar. And so that sense of of inventing by way of returning to what's given and kind of reworking it into new possibilities. And that being the means by which to advance these new political and social and aesthetic forms is what I wanted to, wanted to really get at and hold on to because I think it was and is important to many, um, to many artists. And it doesn't have to start with 
um, with Chef Baraka, certainly Duke Ellington and Bebop itself is about taking what's in the air around us and using that as a vehicle to um, push, push things forward aesthetically and socially. Right. So it has to do with, um, you know, what it means to continually index the blues or insistently mention that this is also blues, you know, that, which we hear many of these artists doing throughout their, their lives. Um, the other, um, well, I, you know, you, you, you gestured towards um, this conception of black communism and, and the excerpt you read, but it, you know, it deserves a bit more exegesis, let's say. <laughs> so I wonder <laughs> how you'd, um, uh, you know, I was particularly interested in how you linked it to the undercommons and, and to that text as another kind of uh, generative work that's working with a similar idea. Yeah, it's, I, you, I, I guess I, I will confess here, there were many times that um, I almost just deleted it because I thought, oh, this is going to be controversial, this is going to engage as a certain kind of left historiography um, that I didn't really want to didn't really want to deal with. But I, the more I thought about it, if communism is defined by ways of relating to each other that are not subtended by the production of value, if that is one thing, and actually you, I saw you give a lecture of Vijay on improvisation as something that um, socially has a kind of zero value but that has enabled uh, many people to receive important grants and capital, um, that there was something there to really hang with and to linger with. And that because I like the undercommons and I think of my work as parallel to it and to those arguments, but I wanted to hold on to communism because I think that they, at least ideally, people wanted to imagine forms of kind of uh, social forms that would not necessarily exclude people and that weren't, didn't require exploitation or kind of vertical top-down relationships. That there's something about that expanse and that expansive imagining of the social and the being together that the word communism indexes in a way that other words just don't. Right. Yeah, it keeps demanding that you reread what you just read <laughs> to say like oh that is that is what you mean that is what you mean and that and actually how that word starts to open up in new ways through your reading and your use of it um very exciting the last thing i want to ask you about before i know there's a ton of questions which i also have not been reading because it's hugely distracting but um but uh is about temporality and well i guess two things two moments in the text one is we talk about rhythm, I guess, in the context of Cecil Taylor. I might actually read that passage. But then there's also something about time, this capital T time as a sort of like, um, I don't know, the, the time of the paradigm, let's say, or the time of governance, the time of the social order within and between and under which different kinds of more intimate scale temporalities um, unfold. But then, yeah, so there's this passage about rhythm, which I, um, I yeah, I'm gonna walk around with this for a while. <laughs> it says, uh, it's in the context of talking about Cecil Taylor, rhythm, which famously he called life, the space of time danced through. Connects Taylor's disparate claims to play the piano as if it were 88 tuned drums and to quote, try to imitate on the piano, the leaps in space a dancer makes. It is Taylor's most general term for what I've been terming a philosophy of the outside, rhythm as philosophy of the outside, a term for movement that links the subjective and objective beyond the predicates of energy. It perhaps can serve as a name for meaning as movement rather than destination. And from that perspective, re-energize our listening, constitutive aesthetics that makes a we. Um, 
beyond the binary is that typically mark a refusal or inability to listen. So this like very provocative um, splitting open of, of rhythm as we know it instead as this, um, this space of, um, as this generative space, well, movement rather than destination. I think like maybe we start, maybe we starting there and what that does and you know, what that does to time, you know, what that does to a, our overarching concepts of time, how um, conceiving of movement rather than time, maybe is a, is a way yeah. the, so as a generative um, move, I don't know. <laughs> There's so thank you for that. Um, so I'll, let, me, let me start at the beginning. The capital T time and lowercase t time is a distinction I draw from Gayatri Spivak. And um, it's from her the, the idea that um, capital T time is official time, is the time that is recorded in archives, and that when historians go to reconstruct a moment, they will. Uh, draw on and think about. I was just teaching um, Black Reconstruction in America and the distinction between the time of when you tell the story of the Civil War from the vantage point of the various generals and the state or states, that's one kind of time. But if you think as Du Bois asks us to about the enslaved and their staggered decision to, to leave the plantation and then eventually to join the Union Army, that's something else. And it's a kind of temporality, a kind of rhythm of life that is not often, and that indeed Du Bois himself doesn't really capture or grapple with um, because his scope is still to make a particular kind of intervention and to tell a particular kind of history. It's not a critique of him, just a, an observation. With Taylor, I think one of the things that I was trying to do is that chapter, I kept confronting the people on the one hand who wanted to just link him as a kind of late European modernist who's legible through the, BN, the second Viennese school, people like Scharnberg um, at Alia, and then people, the perspective of people like Eckerhard Yost, who the great critic, I mean, he's truly a great critic, and he gets, he gets Cecil Taylor dead wrong to me because he says, well, this is all about energy, and so it's not really doing anything. And so even if we take him on his own terms, that decision not to progress is calling us to sit with what Taylor is doing. That it's, the, it's a kind of answer to Mingus. If Mingus wanted capitulation and the kind of usual stuff of song form for which you need a Danny Richmond, Taylor wanted that open-endedness to continue to explore and to create little eddies and spaces where different things can happen. And for that, you, he needs a Sonny Murray um, would be the way to, to talk about that. So that there is a kind of open-endedness and a will to ongoing, to ongoingness that I think rhythm is, is maybe not the best name for, but it's also maybe the only name we have. So mm -hmm. you're right, you've, you've kind of picked up, I, it, there's a Derridian impulse in that, I can't really hide from it, that we, this is the name that we have and it doesn't do everything that we want it to do, but there's not another name. So we have to figure out um, mm -hmm. how to listen in a way that lets us hear that, even though every uh, impulse that I have, I was like a high school drummer. And so I know how to mark the top of a form. I know how to listen for form and to say, I need to learn how to listen to this. It's just gonna go in other ways and generate and resolve tension in different ways. Well, it reminds me of, I think that same talk that you saw me give, I quoted um, <laughs> this, this rehearsal tape of Ornette Coleman with Ed Blackwell. Do you remember this? And um, you, you can find this on YouTube. It's, it was seemingly posted by someone in Ed Blackwell's family. So it's, you know, it's a group with Ornette, um, David Eisenson, Dewey Redman, and, and maybe Charlie is in there too, Charlie Hayden and Ed Blackwell. And Ornette Coleman keeps like, he'll rehearse, he's rehearsing the band, but he keeps stopping them after about 10 seconds. He says, and there's a moment where he says to Blackwell, he says, see right there, you did what you were supposed to do. 
And he was like, <laughs> yeah. And he said, no, I want you to cut loose. He says, I want you to cut loose the method. When you cut loose the method, what's left is stone presence. That's the line right there, which is kind of what you're talking about, I think, which is the method being like marking form in that particular way that you were describing your own playing as a teenager, um, that method of uh, doing what you're supposed to, doing what is expected, doing, speaking the um, received language. Um, and when you, you know, it's a bit of an impossible um, assignment, like, no, everything you know how to do, stop doing it, you know, what do you do now? <laughs> Whatever there is in that struggle, that's what he names as presence, right, a stone presence. And that intensifier is, um, it seems to be kind of what you're getting at. It's between presence and then the articulation of time through movement. Um, yes, anyway, we could go on and on. I, I, I want to, um, I'm probably up against the time limit here, but I, I would love to catch up with some of these questions. Am I supposed to do that or is someone else doing um, that? I will, uh, I'm happy to jump in and do this part. Uh, so we have a number of questions. So why don't we start? Jonathan Leal, do you want to unmute and ask your question? I know you have two, maybe just pick one and I'm not sure we'll get to the second one. We'll see. Thanks so much. And uh, thank you, professors Reed and Iyer for your brilliance and uh, to Carl and Eric for organizing all of this. It's a real pleasure to share space with everybody. I'll actually just ask one question that's not either the ones that I posted in the chat. Um, I'm in picking up on this idea of learning um, and method. Uh, I'm really curious to know, uh, Professor Reed, uh, what you had to unlearn in order to produce this beautiful book uh, and what you learned in the process of writing this that you're carrying forward into your new work. I, maybe I'll, I'll, tell, a, I'll, I'll tell an anecdote that'll describe what I had to unlearn. I remember, and it'll be brief, I took saxophone lessons and I was listening to that New York Art Quartet record and I all excited ran into my teacher and said, hey, listen to what um, Louis Ruel is doing. I think he's playing an F minor and I pressed play. My teacher listened to about three seconds and said, you think he's playing in a key? And that was actually the moment that shifted my, my paradigm that made me understand, oh, that's what it means. I mean, I think that when I understood what free drumming really meant was that I started to pay attention to what drummers were doing and thought, oh, they're just not marking choruses at all. There's a, and that enables the soloist to go over the chorus line and you get these, the solo form doesn't recapitulate the improv form. And from those kinds of observations, I learned to listen to the music on its own terms and stop trying to fit it into the kind of training that um, as for anyone for whom such training is hard won, I really wanted to hold on to it. I really wanted to make everything kind of make a certain kind of sense that was familiar to me. I think the other thing I had to unlearn, though, is just historical and political. I had to re rethink and reimagine what was happening in the 60s, starting from asking, what would it have really been like to be alive and to be Archie Shep, say, or maybe Raka in those moments? And to try to really imagine, they're saying the revolution is here, and they believe it, and for good reason. And so how to get into that mindset that it's not a foregone conclusion that you know, ain't no revolution, Archie, you know, as, which is the tone some of his critics take in that kind of disrespectful familiarity even. Um, so I think those are the two, the two big things. And once I did that, I was able to just see and hear very differently. All right, Carl Wilson has a question. Yeah, um, hi, um, this has been so great, thank you. Um, and I feel a little embarrassed because this feels like a bit of a basic question, but I do keep thinking about it, is that in the tradition of um, poets doing spoken word or related forms along with music, um, I kept wondering how you conceptualize the differences between that form of the voice in the music and, um, and the voice of the singer in the music and maybe the middle ground too of like vocalese or you know nonverbal 
singing that is, and I wonder how this changes the way that these musical texts operate and what their aesthetic and political effects are in your analysis. And maybe the uh, flip side of that is is rapping, which you address not addressing at some point. Yeah, it's um, Carl. Just for clarification, when you you refer to spoken word, you mean um, people um, like Saul Williams and Ursula Rucker and Jessica Caremore. Sure, but also just generally a po the poet doing poetry, you know, in the in the context of of, of a musical thing. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so I think with all of the above, and so starting with the, the poetry, I always try to think about who are the people, when is it happening, what is the, the you know the, the 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 substance of the poem. So Jessica Care Moore has a poem with Antonio Hart from '98, um, "Words Don't Fit in My Mouth," that she they're playing a kind of hip hop groove, you know, this heavily syncopated thing. Um, with a you know heavy funk beat, and she's doing a sort of poem criticizing the the inadequacy of the English language. And so there's a couple of things going on. It's impulse in the midst of the, the Young Lions movement. Um, it's Jessica Care Moore, Detroit Sound, um, with this a terrific poem that's performed in the, in the slam style. Antonio Hart and the band are really trying to catch the ear of hip hop listeners and kind of give them something else to think about. And so in the context of, if you turned off your Rakim record and turned this one on, um, you went from one idea of verbal mastery to a very different one of what does it mean to master. I would try, start to trace the politics um, out from that. With regard to other instances, of, I mean, I, I shouldn't have been dismissive. I refer to a kind of Dobie Gillis, um, you know, Bob Denver style of a kind of beatnik poetry that was associ also associated with the village and places in on the West Coast. I think that some of those instances are people who they have an idea of jazz in mind and they're really thinking of themselves as performing jazz. And I've seen people, contemporary people will do that. And I, I suppose if I were going to analyze it, there the question would also be, well, what do they mean by jazz? And what did they, what does their poetry seem to be trying to do? Um, and I would start the analysis from that. Vocalese and rap, I mean, we should have another conversation. It's as though you were reading the manuscripts when I had to delete all the things that I could, the, the, the rap on the R&B record before hip hop. It's like all the things I really wanted to get at of kind of people speaking or otherwise using the voice on records that I just felt this book is gonna be, it's gonna just become an encyclopedia and maybe we need that, but I didn't wanna, I didn't wanna write it. Um, but I do have, I think vocalese is a terrifically interesting phenomenon and something that um, I hope to give some more thought to before too long. Well, I did think I, did the, I, oh, go ahead. I was just gonna say, I think the fact that you focus on poet, spoken poetry that's not musically measured, not measured in the same units that the musical rhythm units might be measured. And so that's kind of why I used the word discrepant earlier as, as to, and that seems to be the running kind of juxtaposition that, and what that juxtaposition does, what it, how it kind of unleashes a different quality of listening or reading or both. That's, that's my, <laughs> how about that? <laughs> that's such a, a terrific phrase. Yeah, that's that's exactly the, that's exactly the distinction I would draw. It's just not measured in the same units of the music. It doesn't have the same kind of ornamental relationship to the music um, in the kind of musical context. So that incommensurability seems to matter. Yeah, Sounds or like. or at least the kind of different models of commensurability that you need different mm -hmm. you need to imagine different contexts within which these are commensurate forms. It's not a kind of given because they don't come as a as a package. Right. But then you could also it seems that some of some of the um, instances you choose seem that the musical content is the rhythmic, rhythmic content of the music is actually more at the level of speech than at the level of pulse. 
so there's a there's something there going on too that like in New York Art Quartet, for example, where these other kinds of alignments emerge, it's almost like the poetry drives or conjures a different music. Anyway. Yeah. I don't <clears throat> I don't I'm 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 aware that as we could kind of keep keep talking and I know that there are other questions yes. I don't want to um over yeah. uh, overstep our host's patience. That's right. <laughs> Let's get some more questions if we can. Okay. Um, so Anne Powers, you have a, a few questions. Is there one that you want to ask first and we'll see if we have time to come back around for more? First of all, it was just fun to hear y'all talk. So I, I could just lay back, man, and listen, it's great. And this is super fun for me because I have been spending quarantine time like listening to a lot more jazz than I felt I could when I was like full on uh, working the pop beat, but I'm, my knowledge is nothing compared to yours. So thank you so much for such a rich conversation. Um, I'll just go with my first question I pose and then slip in the second one real quick. The first question I have is it's an interesting time, Anthony, for this book to come out, given the um, sort of popular culture efflorescence of, of, uh, of, of images and, and narratives related to both jazz and black power right now. Mm. I mean, look at the Oscar nominations of just yesterday where we have Ma Rainey's Black Bottom, uh, the Billie Holiday movie, also though the Fred Hampton movie and the Chicago 7 movie, the um, One Night in Miami movie. It's like, for this is capturing the popular imagination and the imagination of mainstream filmmakers especially, but, um, and I'm just curious, I noticed that, you know, jazz as resistance or jazz performance as resistance is kind of in the popular mind, but mostly through very mainstream, well now mainstream figures or revered figures like Billie Holiday. And then Black Power and that moment of resistance is, is popular, but there's not a lot of music referenced in those narratives, like in, in the Black Messiah movie. So I'm wondering, what you how what would you envision? I'd be for both of you, especially for you, Anthony. What would you envision being an adequate uh, popular culture representation of the moment historical moment you're describing? Is it possible? Would it be possible for a Netflix series to capture the moment? And what do you fear? What would make you cringe <laughs> in that happening? <laughs> wow. Well, um... Thank you, Anne, for that. See, we're recording, so I don't want to say um, what I would say if I was just at your house about what would make me cringe. Um, maybe I would say that, so, you know, we had Ken Burns's jazz series that was incredibly disrespectful to um, creative musicians. You had Branford saying that Cecil Taylor was, was I forget if it was, he was just bullshitting, I think is what. Branford said. So that's that would be the worst possible version. You would get a bunch of people together to kick rocks at um, at the music. But what I think would also what would be bad would be, and one thing that I try to be careful about is um, the, there's a version of the story that emphasizes Europe as saving grace and says all those people had to go over to Europe to play. And that makes the, you know, the French and the Germans and to a lesser extent, the English, really the champions of the music and the true home of it. Um, and I think that either a version that wanted to renationalize the music or that uncritically accepted the place of Europe and thus white audiences, white European audiences would really miss an opportunity to ask questions about, well, why do those musicians go to Europe? What's happening in the United States beyond the kind of version of civil rights that's familiar to us all that would make it appealing? And then some of those people come back and to, um, in so many of the accounts of the creative music, there's not a lot of thinking about, well, then they came back. Um, there's a brilliant book, Eric Porter's What Is This Thing Called Jazz, talks about y'all, the AACM, they all went to Europe, and then he turns to Branford and it's like, well, wait a minute, by the time those Branford and Ed Alley are emerging, Red Gill, Wadada Leo Smith, um, Muha Richard Abrams, they're all in New York. 
So they're like, they're neighbors to the Lincoln Center. They're not kind of, they're not opposed. And I think that the, to, to be uh, Curtis Mayfield about it, if we tell the whole story, that needs to be part of it too. Um, and I think that that would start to be adequate to capture the moment in this complexity. That leads nicely into my little slipping in question, which because it's related to Vision Festival, the other neighbor of Lincoln Center, downtown mirror of Lincoln Center, which is uh, this week uh, Vision Festival or the 21st they're presenting an Amina Claudine Myers birthday celebration. And I put it in the link for anybody who wants to go. But I wondered if both or either of you would like to say some words for her. Um, I know you mentioned her in the book, Anthony, but you don't go into her too much, but just honoring her on the, her 79th birthday. Yes, um, one of the great, one of the most difficult choices was when I realized that I wasn't going, it didn't, I couldn't find a way to give her adequate respect and care within the chapters as I had conceived them. And that I wanted to mention her. Um, she's brilliant in her own right and really just such a wonderful creative musician. I'm glad that she's being celebrated. And um, other than being in, in, you know, saying I'm in awe of her artistry and I'll try to find a way to engage her work, her, her later work and her contemporary work um, as I continue to think about this material and the, and the legacy. Um, it was, it was very much an absence that uh, I, I didn't want to have to cut her, but I also didn't think I could include her in a way that was respectful and that had the kind of care that she deserved without writing a, another chapter um, that I, I thought the book would then be too long. Well, you did uh, Jean Lee a lot of credit though. So thank you for that, appreciate it. Yes. I'll just say that I, uh, you know, I idolize Amina. I was one of the highlights of my earthly life. I think it was earthly, but it actually felt like we left the planet for a moment. Was that we got to play some duets, two pianos, mm. um, and just the the endless generosity of her artistry. So stunning to me. Um, she yeah, she just lifts everyone up. It's it's really pleasure and I got my ticket for the 21st so I'll be there. All right, uh, David Grubbs has the final question for the evening. Thank you. Uh, thank you all so much for this conversation and um, really looking forward to the book. I was interested in the introduction um, that you referred to the upsurge in uh, phonographic poetry, I think you say since 2014. Um, mm -hmm. And the artists that you reference uh, are uh, Moore Mother with Art Ensemble of Chicago, Mottner Roberts. And I was just curious, um, I, I mean, I guess the, the simplest version is, you know, how, 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 does, how has that upsurge of artists and particularly female artists working in, you know, in different media in the distribution of their recorded works, how has that affected your conceptualization of the more historical material in the book? Well, thank you for that. And the moment, it's one of the things that, it was an intuition and I, just, I, I think it's right that when there are moments of um, real political upheaval, moments of real, of black reckoning with the state and its limitations to protect and honor our lives, that there tends to be a correspondent upsurge in recordings. And so not, you know, in, this, in the 60s, um, you, you see the, there's the archive that I'm primarily focused on. Around 92, there's an upsurge with people like Don Byron um, and others recording poems along with their music. And then also now post 2014, which was just a convenient, um, a convenient marker because it seemed to me, having been researching this for a while, there was it just. When I looked at my own discography and my, you know, my own computer, was I noticed that wow, there are a lot more things that I'm adding to my little phonographic poetry file that I'm trying to keep track. One of the things I tried to do in the book is to really achieve gender parity, 
because it's easy to tell the story um, as if it's just all men. And it's just materially not all men. There really are, women are, if women have a secondary role in this tradition, it's because of things like sexism and not because of their failure to participate. It's because they didn't have the kind of access to recording um, and not, and for no other reason that I can tell. And there are also people, you know, Anne asked about Amina Claudine Meyer, Sarah Webster Fabio is somebody else that there's a version of this book that really would have engaged her that, I, I mean, I, maybe I just need to do a separate um, article that can really touch on, touch on them and what, what I think they're up to. But the other thing, David, to your question, I think that there now is in the, in the world of creative music, it seems that there's at least more intentionality on the part of many to make sure that there are spaces that are welcoming to and conducive to women who compose and, and record, and thus more women who lead bands under their own names, get studio, get recording dates and kind of contracts under their own names. So that's, I think, one just important historical context. But the other is that it's, you know, as many activists will point out, Black Lives Matter has been led primarily by Black women and queer Black women. And so it's not a surprise that people like Mike Reed or um, uh, Penderhughes, Samaya Penderhughes, I think is his first name. Samara. Samara, sorry. Yeah, it's really just... <laughs> I, I apologize, You've, you're now all witness to my the, the poor with names, let's write them all down <laughs> or I will butcher them. But um, there, there are people, there are men involved, but it's not a surprise given the larger pol um, political context that women would be leading the charge and would be at the forefront aesthetically too. I mean, it, it only um, stands to reason in a way. And this is being recorded, and so there's a there's a flippant offhand comment that I will reserve <laughs> for some other more opportune time about what men seem to be doing in response. That's not that. Yes. Great. <laughs> thank you. Thank you. Well, thank you all. Uh, that was such a fantastic conversation. Thank you.